Fellow Vice-Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, I'm David Feldman, I'm the Chairman of the Law Faculty, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you. I have to start with uh, a safety announcement. Um, in the event of an emergency, um, <laughs> we hope the unlikely event, um, there will be um, warnings given, and uh, we would be grateful if you would leave the lecture theatre quickly and quietly. There are four exits, two at the back, <laughs> two at the front. In, 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 in the event of a sudden loss of cabin pressure, <laughs> um, and if you turn either left or right to the top, you will find yourself heading directly towards an emergency exit. Leave through it. <laughs> and uh, then the assembly point is round at the front of the building um, uh, afterwards. Um, now down, down to business. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2007 Mackenzie Stewart Lecture, uh, which is to be given this year by uh, a leading member of the government, the Right Honourable Jack Straw, MP. Um, and we're obviously delighted to welcome uh, Mr Straw, together with his wife, uh, Alice Perkins. Thank you for uh, coming. Um, it's also a special pleasure to welcome members of the family of uh, Lord Mackenzie Stewart, after whom the lectures are, are named. Um, Lady Mackenzie Stewart again honours us with, with her presence, together with um, her daughter Judy, who uh, together with um, Mr Peter King also represents Sherman and Sterling, the firm which generously sponsors these lectures. Uh, we also uh, welcome uh, Lady Mackenzie Stewart's granddaughter, Dr Daisy Hay, a member of New Hall in this university, and her husband, Dr. Matthew Santa. Uh, to all of you, a particularly warm welcome. Um, the Mackenzie Stewart Lectures are held, as you know, under the auspices of the Centre for European Legal Studies here, um, and started in 1997 um, as an initiative uh, led by Professor Alan Dashwood to honour the memory of a great European lawyer, uh, the late Lord Mackenzie Stewart, uh, who was an, a distinguished alumnus of this faculty and of Sydney Sussex College. He took first class honours in part two of the law tripos here, obtained the degree of LLB with distinction from the University of Edinburgh and went into practice at the Scottish Bar. Uh, having become a judge of the Court of Session in Scotland, he was appointed to be the British judge at the Court of Justice of the European Communities. He took up his position there in January 1973 and did much to overcome suspicion of the UK's Euro scepticism among the other judges. Um, as his successor, Judge David Edwards, has written, and Judge Edwards has himself delivered one of these uh, Mackenzie Stewart lectures, Lord Mackenzie Stewart's readiness not simply to accept what other judges, that other judges saw things from a different point of view, but also to learn why they did so, quickly earned him the trust and respect of his colleagues and led in due course to his election as President of the European Court of Justice. As President, he was instrumental in many important developments, um, both in the case law of the court and in administrative matters, smoothing the way to a new building and um, to the new court structure, including the court of first instance to address the um, growing caseload of the court. These lectures mark Lord Mackenzie Stewart's enduring legacy to European law. And as I said, they are generously supported by uh, Sherman and Sterling. They've been delivered by outstanding European lawyers, judges, politicians and administrators, um, and this evening's lecture is a worthy member of that distinguished line. The Right Honourable Jack Straw MP uh, has been MP for Blackburn since 1979, and he's currently Secretary of State for Justice and Lord Chancellor, the first person to hold the post of Lord Chancellor while not sitting in the House of Lords. 
He took a degree in law from the University of Leeds and was called to the bar by the Inner Temple, of which he is a bencher. So he is, in that sense, one of us. Um, during his student career, he took a great interest in student politics and became president of the National Union of Students from 1969 to 71. So he's also, for many of pe the people in this room, one of you. And <laughs> <laughs> he then pursued his, his political interests as a member of Islington Borough Council um, and was um, also from 77 to 79 a journalist working for the Granada Television World in Action program. Um, since being elected an MP, he's had a distinguished parliamentary career and following the 1997 general election, he became Home Secretary. In that role, he had overall responsibility for many important legal developments, including, perhaps most importantly for, for, from this evening's point of view, uh, the, the, the task of uh, steering the Human Rights Bill, which became the Act of 1998 through the House of Commons, and overseeing its implementation in the period up to 2000. Um, he also uh, was a leading light in developing proposals for the European Arrest Warrant uh, and the broader question of mutual recognition of decisions by criminal courts and prosecuting authorities in Europe, a matter um, on which our own Professor John Spencer, uh, one of the co-directors of the centre, ha has been closely involved. After the 2001 election, uh, Mr. Straw became Foreign Secretary and he handled, if I may say so, with statesmanlike aplomb, um, what some of you will remember as a little local difficulty in relation to the affairs of Iraq. Um, he he, he uh, lost that position in 2006, perhaps for being too statesmanlike. Um, as, as my hero, Professor Albus Dumbledore, once <laughs> said, um, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. Uh, he then became Lord Privy Seal and leader of the House of Commons from 2006 to 7, uh, had special responsibility for taking forward House of Lords reform. Earlier this year, he, he, he ran Gordon Brown's successful campaign to succeed uh, Mr. Blair as leader of the Labour Party, um, and after uh, that became Secretary of State for Justice and, as I said, Lord Chancellor in, in Mr. Brown's government. Mr. Straw's involvement with some of the most interesting legal developments of the past 10 years, um, notably the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights, um, makes him eminently qualified to deliver this year's Mackenzie Stewart Lecture. On behalf of the Centre for European Legal Studies, it gives me great pleasure to invite Mr. Straw to deliver the lecture on human rights in the 21st century. Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, if you're wondering about my guffaw when my uh, previous uh, uh, convictions as uh, President of the Stu National Union of Students were referred to, it was because last night I heard an episode on the radio of uh, the latest book by Robert Harris, which is a, a, th I'm a thinly disguised uh, novel uh, a a about a, a a, a prime minister who bears a striking resemblance to a prime minister who I knew uh, very well, uh, who, who left office on the 28th of June of this year. Uh, and uh, the, the particular passage um, uh, is, is one where uh, this prime minister, who's called Adam, um, uh, is explaining how when he was at university he took no interest whatsoever in student politics and he regarded uh, student politicians uh, as a number of nerdy anoraks, I quote. Uh, uh, and I smiled and whether, wondered whether he continued to think that uh, of those of us who've been involved uh, all the way through his career. The other thing I, I was going to say was, was that when I did a similar lecture a few months ago in Oxford, uh, in the middle of this lecture, uh, 
Not the same lecture, let me tell you. <laughs> Not the same one. Uh, in the middle of this lecture, um, a barber shop uh, quartet uh, stood up uh, and, and, and uh, started, in actually very good uh, harmony, uh, uh, to heckle me. Um, <laughs> Uh, this was because of uh, Iraq, although the lecture was not really whatever to do with Iraq. Anyway, it later transpired uh, that they had been paid by the BBC uh, out of licensed players' money, uh, because, and there was a film crew there, which often there is, uh, and, and this was to test how I'd react to heckling. Um, as I, I had no idea that, that uh, they'd been paid, I, I obviously spotted that they were heckling me. Uh, and, <laughs> and I thought the best thing to do was to conduct them until they'd finished or exhausted themselves. <laughs> Uh, and because of that, they, of course, the, 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 this test uh, never, as far as I can, I'm told, s uh, saw the light of day. But anyway, if there is a barbershop quartet here, please make yourself known. Uh, we, can, we can get over and done with, with the, uh, the singing at the beginning, and I'll get on, on with my lecture. Now, if, if you read certain newspapers, you might be forgiven for thinking that human rights were an alien imposition foisted on us by the other. It's a mis misconception which has regrettably taken some root. So a central theme of my lecture this evening is to explode this myth and to demonstrate how far from being some European imposition, Britain has been at the forefront of the political and legal development of human rights across Europe and across the world. I regret very much that I was never fortunate enough uh, to meet Lord Mackenzie Stewart in person, but I hope that my lecture does do some justice to his memory, of whom we are here to honour this evening. Uh, we've heard already that as the first United Kingdom judge and later president to sit in the European Court of Justice, Lord Mackenzie Stewart's reputation goes before him as a preeminent figure, not just in United Kingdom, but in European law. His career is not only testament to the profound influence which British jurists have had on the furthering of democracy in Europe, but he personified all the very best qualities of the British judiciary. And it's my pleasure as well uh, this evening to uh, met uh, uh, Lady Mackenzie Stewart. I'm very honoured, Lady Mackenzie Stewart, that you are here and have been joined, uh, joined uh, by your daughter, Judy, and by your granddaughter, Daisy, uh, and by her husband, Matthew. And I've learnt... <laughs> I got that right, didn't I? <laughs> and I've learnt... Uh, I won't go into all the rest that I've learnt about the Mackenzie Stewart family, uh, uh, but I could do. Um, let me also, uh, as, as was indicated in the brief biographical note to which you were uh, 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 suffered, uh, 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 and it declare some interest. I was a lawyer, a criminal barrister, and I practiced briefly uh, in the 1970s before becoming a politician. And as we've heard, as Home Secretary, uh, I was the minister who took the Human Rights Bill through Parliament and saw it brought into, forth, into force on the 2nd of October uh, 2000, which, let me say, we chose with some deliberation because it uh, was the anniversary of Gandhi's birth. I, I mention this because throughout our history, lawyers, politicians and judges have not necessarily seen eye to eye, especially on issues like that under discussion this evening. Indeed, a predecessor of mine as Lord Chancellor, Lord Jowett, himself a lawyer, a politician and a judge, uh, embodied this tension. As a lawyer, he disliked some of the imprecise drafting of the European Convention of Human Rights. As a judge, he was concerned about the application of what he called such a half-baked scheme. But as a politician, he decided that it was clearly in the national interest to agree to it. Behind this example lies a point of substance. The history of rights has been typified by the search for a balance of principle and practicality, what they represent and how they can effectively be applied under the law. Human rights are our birthright as human beings. They're not the, the gift of government, but part of our common humanity. However, too, they have to be seen in the context of the time. What was adopted and proclaimed at the United Nations on the 10th of December 1948 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was not of itself intended to create legal rights. That declaration was aspirational, offering a normative counterpoint to the evils which had so recently gone before. It was an expression of a global desire and drive to establish common standards applicable to all humankind. The European Convention of Human Rights was born from this, taking the non-enforceable Universal Declaration as its base, but developing the principles which underpinned it through the protection and framework of the law 
and with the means ultimately to enforce that law through the European Court. What I want to do in this lecture is look at how our sense of rights and obligations since then has altered over the last half century and suggest that the formulation of human rights from the 50s are, the formulations of human rights from the 50s are robust and timeless, but they need further to be adapted to take account of major changes in the United Kingdom, Europe, and the rest of the world, particularly over the past two decades. First, I want to look briefly at the genesis of that modern notion of international human rights, articulated in the face and immediate aftermath of an existential threat to the values and civilization of Europe. Second, I'm going to argue that today Britain faces a new set of challenges, both internationally and at home, which require us to look again at our mechanism of rights. And finally, I want to discuss our plans to publish a green paper uh, concerning a British Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, which will build on the enormous progress in the development of rights, but so that our system meets the needs and expectations of this century, as well as of the last. With the wounds of the Second World War far from heel, the European Convention was agreed to protect the citizens of Europe from ever again experiencing the horrors of totalitarianism. We were among the first to sign it in November 1950, and the first to ratify it in 1951. And it, it seems, I think, curious that given the significance and sentiment behind the circumstances of the genesis of what became the European Convention, that in some circles today, human rights are seen, as I said in my opening paragraph, as an unwelcome European creation, as if in any event, Europe was culturally and philosophically separate from us. But far from being grafted on by some continental, I suppose, Napoleonic Europe, Britain, in fact, was at the forefront of the development of the Convention of, of our ideas of human rights in a context which had ramifications for the whole world. The notion of internationally recognized freedoms had been enunciated during the last war in 1941 by Churchill and Roosevelt in the Atlantic Charter. And men like Churchill and Roosevelt were alive to the fact that just winning a war was not going to win a peace because they had been through uh, not just the horrors of the First World War, but the deep instability and depression which followed that war and the circumstances, the failure to secure a peace uh, which, and, and the failure of international institutions in those intervening uh, two decades, which in turn uh, laid the foundations uh, for the Second War. And so after the war and building on uh, the Atlantic Charter, Britain was instrumental in developing a system of rights designed primarily to limit the ability of governments to restrict the individual liberties of their citizens. And this differed from and developed the conception of liberty as described, say, by Dicey, which was based around the philosophy that individuals were free to do that which was not forbidden without clarity as to where that freedom might end. On the 20th of July, 1950, the then Foreign Office Minister, Kenneth Younger, uh, stated that the European Convention, in which these rights by then were to be enshrined, quotes, contains a definition of the rights and limitations thereto, which follow almost word for word the actual texts proposed by the United Kingdom uh, representatives. We led the negotiations, we led the drafting, we led the way in Europe. And it's worth, worth pointing out that in the 19, late 40s and 1950s, it was very much an all-party exercise. Jarrett was a Labour Lord Chancellor, Kenneth Younger a Labour Foreign uh, Minister. The negotiations were led by a man who'd been uh, an, an at the Attorney General uh, before that and who later went on to be Conservative uh, Lord Chancellor as Viscount Kilmuir, David Maxwell Fife. The Convention rights have a long British pedigree, rooted in the Magna Carta in the 1689 Bill of Rights uh, and in habeas corpus, and can be read as a manifestation of the values that were already deeply embodied within our common law. Now, it's difficult for any of us today, from the comfort of 60 years hence, to understand completely the abject horrors of Nazism, nor to comprehend fully the egregious human rights abuse, abuses which for more than 40 years after the war were kept hidden behind the Iron Curtain. And if it's hard for 
my generation, still more so, I suggest, for later ones, to come to terms with the fact that humankind was capable of such organized evil, or to appreciate the sense of utter powerlessness which so many not just felt but had to experience in the face of such organized evil. This is particularly true from a British perspective, when for centuries we have been spared the ordeal of totalitarianism, occupation, or revolution. And our his history, uh, for at least three and a half centuries, has been the story of the growth of an enabling and not a repressive state. However, elsewhere in Europe, and not just going back some centuries, but in recent decades, we have seen more seismic developments, with first the collapse of fascism in Spain and Portugal in the 1970s, the banishment of the military junta in Greece, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the demise of the Soviet Union in 1991, the, the Balkans uh, throughout, uh, throughout the 1990s. For many in, in, ac across Europe who had been denied until recently the liberties which we in the United Kingdom have for so long taken for granted. And as a result of those changes, as, as, a, as a result actually of the leadership which both NATO and the European Union were able to provide, uh, Europe is now a very different place. Europe has become wealthier, stronger, safer, more secure. There's a common rec recognition that prosperity and security derives from sharing common purpose. And Lord Stein put it well when he said, observance of human rights it, it is instrumentally valuable. It tends to promote the conditions in which democratic systems can flourish for the benefit of people generally. The European Convention has now been incorporated in the laws of 47 states across Europe, East and West, by one means or another. A shared human rights culture is something that can help bind us together and provide a common set of values around which, which Europe can unite. Now, in spite of advances in Europe, the old threat to humankind from authoritarian regimes in functioning states still remains in other parts of the world. There are still too many examples. We see them today in Burma, where such states deny basic rights to their own citizens and pose a threat in turn to their immediate neighbors and their region. Now on top of these, as it were, old threats, are new threats which derive not from the organized political despotism of a Nazi Germany, an Imperial Japan, or a Stalinist Russia, but from terrorists operating internationally and typically, typically based in failed, failing, or rogue states. In the parlance of democracy, these non-state actors operate outside of the moral and legal parameters that define how democratic states uh, operate and by which every other state is judged and may even have its own behavior moderated. These groups exist without regard for life, the rule of law, or human rights. They're bound neither by law nor ethics, the cornerstones of how any democratic society has to respond. And the threat from this Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorism is wholly asymmetrical. Our diplomatic, military, security, law enforcement, and legal judicial systems were never designed to counter it. it. It's made it hard to protect our citizens. Yes, states across the globe have had to deal with terrorism on a significant scale throughout our history. But what characterizes the current threat is a number of things. It's truly international scope. Foreign nationals operating for a second country funded from a third attacking a fourth. Its aims, its methods, and the technologies used, the scale of its murderous ambition. And despite the considerable efforts and achievements of the intelligence, security, and law enforcement agencies, it is the unpredictability of such international terrorism which creates a sense of fear and instability very different in character and scale from that experience, for example, in this country over three decades from the provisional IRA or in Spain from the Basque separate terrorist group ETA. Governments have to act to protect life and laws must change to meet the imperatives of national security. This is not the lecture to discuss the fullness of our counter-terrorism response, but suffice it to say the statute book has and must play an integral part to that. But our counter-terrorism legislation has to strike a balance between the tensions of public safety on the one hand and the liberty of the individual on the other within the framework of what is proportionate and legitimate. At a central point 
of my thesis this evening is that far from undermining how we strike that balance in the new situation, a human rights framework used intelligently can help us resolve the tensions. This is exactly what Winston Churchill intended and British officials achieved when they drafted the European Convention. Let me give you a, a familiar example of this tension in operation. The issue of the deportation of foreign nationals, particularly where they are criminal uh, suspects or terrorist suspects. Following the decision of the European Court of Human Rights in Chahal and the United Kingdom, which was a 1996 decision, which predates, therefore, incorporation in the Human Rights Act, it has not been possible to deport certain individuals, including those who might be guilty of serious criminal or terrorism offences, to countries where there is, quote, a real risk of torture or death. The tabloid press and the opposition often cite this as, a, as an illustration of how regard for human rights puts the liberty of the individuals, in this case, I have to say, particularly undesirable individuals, above the safety and interest of the wider community. Now, there is indeed a very live issue as to whether the appropriate test is a real risk or, for example, substantial grounds, whether in a particular instance concerning these suspects of this particular nationality, the risk they would in practice face were they deported to their home country is a high or a minimal one. There are, to be found, genuine and honourably held differences of opinion about what would happen if and when a particular suspect were deported to his or her home country. It's one reason why I, uh, when I was Foreign Secretary, and the government now more generally, has been instrumental in securing memorandum of understanding with such countries better to guarantee and to monitor the safety of deportees. But I do not believe, and indeed I cannot believe, that anyone is seriously proposing that we should ignore the risk of harm, even where this, is, this risk is incontrovertibly high and well evidenced. And so were we to ignore that risk, we were, uh, what it's being suggested that we should outsource the prospect of murder or torture. The principle against this was firmly established in our common law and in our system of values long before either the European Convention or its incorporation into our domestic law. It was the world's first Bill of Rights in 1689 in, in England and Wales and uh, the year before uh, to a degree in Scotland, uh, which outlawed cruel and uh, unusual punishment. And it was this prohibition which was absorbed into modern human rights treaties. And to those who think we should somehow ignore the risk, even if it's a high and well-evidenced one, let us consider for a moment the counterfactual. Just consider the outcry if a British government willfully and knowingly did deport someone, however terrible their own deeds, to gross ill-treatment or death in a foreign country. What Home Secretary, what Prime Minister, would sign away the life of another to return uh, to a, the high risk of torture or judicial murder? What sort of society would we be living in if a, such a decision was deemed to be acceptable? What law could wash the blood from the hands of those who then made that decision? The harm to our international standing in such a situation would be irreparable. The damage to our values fatal. And if we are to enjoy the benefits of a liberal democracy, for it to continue to live in a prosperous, fair and free society, we have to recognise that we have to adhere to the letter and the spirit of human rights. The price we pay for our freedom is not to debase our values. At the same time, we have and we will do our utmost to secure the safety of the British people, and we all have to be prepared to limit individual liberties to the extent, but only the extent, that is necessary. We have human rights and an independent judiciary to establish and to marshal the lawful boundaries of our response. We do not need to resile from the European Convention nor from the Human Rights Act. They already provide us with a framework in which to address security as well as liberty. Indeed, the Human Rights uh, Convention places a duty on the, st the state to protect the life of everyone in its jurisdiction. Where we have problems, as we do over Chahal, with the interpretation of the convention by the Strasbourg court, the proper course for us is to argue robustly before that court. We're doing just that in relation to Chahal, and we have not been alone, because we've done so in concert with Italy, Lith Lithuania, Portugal, 
and Slovakia. Now, 21st century rights do need to address these changing circumstances, not in the principle which underpins them, but in the manner of their application. And I beg your indulgence momentarily for the merest nod, if I may, towards politics. I hope I don't contaminate anybody here uh, in doing so. Because I think uh, by uh, just indulging uh, folk here uh, with a, a political example, it demonstrates better the basis for our approach. While I welcome that rights and responsibilities are again receiving promised, uh, prominence in the political discourse, I fear that there are those in the main opposition party who are wholly wrong in their interpretation of the effects of the Human Rights Act. Their stated position is that the Human Rights Act should be scrapped and replaced by a British Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, which would enable us to take the necessary action against those who commit acts of terrorism. And they continue, if we were to have our own Bill of Rights, uh, the European Convention would be reinterpreted accordingly, and the margin of appreciation would allow us to take more action against those who threaten our country. Now, this argument leaves two rather substantial questions unanswered. First, what is this necessary action against the terrorists to which they refer? Is it to secure a carte blanche to deport people to face a real risk of torture or death? This is a fundamental question. If it's not, what point is being made? Second, um, whatever is meant by this necessary action, the opposition party now say uh, in terms that they won't resile from the European Convention itself. Well, three cheers for that. But if so, how on earth do they propose wholly to circumvent Article 3? It would appear that uh, th their suggestion is they do this uh, by some device in respect of the margin of appreciation. But they have fundamentally misunderstood uh, that notion uh, and the idea that we would be afforded uh, some much wider flexibility if we had a Bill of Rights which ran counter to the European Convention. Any Bill of Rights could not have a reduced set of rights or more heavily qualified rights than currently set out in the, United, in the European Convention without placing the United Kingdom in bleach, breach of its international obligations. Now, studies show that Article 3 is applied similarly, not just in Strasbourg, but also in the domestic courts, for example, in the United Kingdom, Germany, Spain, and France, to name but a few European countries. Any argument that the repeal of the Human Rights Act will mean that the consequences of Article 3 then disappear is as disingenuous as it is flawed. Unless, which is not now being proposed, what is also being proposed is that uh, we should denounce the European Convention, uh, we should leave the European Union, and we should leave the Council of Europe. The margin of appreciation is often mentioned whenever there's discussion about the European Convention. It's become a fabled doctrine, which no matter what the decision in question is, is seemingly trotted out when opponents of the Human Rights Act want to make a point that that act unfairly binds us and delivers perverse results. In fact, their statements uh, show simply that they've misunderstood what the margin actually is. The main opposition party tell you that this, the act, Human Rights Act, means they don't get the full benefit of the margin of appreciation. They say that other countries, notably with their own domestic Bill of Rights, are left alone by the Strasbourg Court. Mr. David Cameron has stated that a British Bill of Rights would have a status similar to that of the German Basic Law, and in so doing, help restore British parliamentary supremacy as against law made elsewhere. By the way, he's never spoken to uh, German parliamentarians uh, who have to, uh, not to uh, enjoy uh, the sovereignty uh, of the Bundestag, uh, but have to accept uh, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe. Now, uh, the opposition point towards the basic law and seem to say, look, the decisions in German courts are rarely interfered with by the Strasbourg court. They're left alone to get on with it. And so they conclude that it is nations like Germany which most benefit from the margin of appreciation. This is a mistaken conclusion because it misses a rather simple point. As I understand it, and it's this, the standard of protection given to individuals by the German basic law is greater and less flexible than that given by the European Convention. As such, decisions made by the German court are therefore rarely overturned by the European court because they do not fall below 
the minimum floor of rights which the European Convention is seeking to establish. And the lack of, a, of interference arises, therefore, not because of any margin of appreciation which is greater uh, than we're able to enjoy, but because the German court takes a more stringent approach to protecting individuals, including those who are very undesirable, in the first place than do we. So I don't think, if they reflect on this, uh, that the main opposition party would find this necessarily consistent uh, with what they say they are trying to achieve. The United Kingdom courts, on the other hand, apply a different proportional test with regard to situations where rights are in conflict. This allows the courts to make a more balanced judgment as opposed to a narrowly to conf confined decision. And far from failing to benefit from any margin of appreciation, the United Kingdom reaps uh, uh, much greater flexibility because our courts tend to take a broader, more balanced approach in much the same way as the European Court does. The Human Rights Act allows British judges to weigh up and to consider the rights and interests not only of the individual, but also those of the wider community. So repealing the Human Rights Act and simply replacing it with a separate Bill of Rights would, I believe, have the effect of restricting the flexibility and the application of balance within the United Kingdom courts. And the current structure of the Human Rights Act does mean that our courts have to grapple with the very same questions as the Strasbourg Court, which enables our courts in turn to exercise, as they have done, an important influence on European court jurisdiction. In this way, we're taking full advantage of the margin of appreciation in a way which respects British judicial making, decision making, and allows for balance. To move towards a German basic law model will, I, I'm convinced, result in a more restrictive application of rights and a loss of any meaningful margin, the opposite of that which the opposition claim. And further, repealing the Human Rights Act uh, would only result in delay for British people seeking justice. Because rather than being able to access a remedy in a British court, heard by British judges, British people would have to look forward to joining the back of a very long queue of those waiting for justice in Strasbourg, which is one of many reasons why a consensus developed in the 1990s, let me say in all parties at the time, as to why we should incorporate uh, most of the articles of the Convention into British law. I'll come on to develop, uh, discuss the government's position on developing human rights policy shortly. But suffice it to say, we consider it a very significant platform on which to build. One of the important things about the Human Rights Act is, that, is the protection and prominence it gives to the very values we are defending. And in seeking to protect the public, it's vital that we don't compromise their or our <coughs> ideals. But whilst the Human Rights Act represents a very significant milestone, the government does not see it as a final resting place in terms of rights policies. The context in which the Act operates has changed enormously, even in the short time since the legislation were pa was passed to, quote, bring rights home. It is from the vantage of point of 2007, rather than that of 1997, that we, we must plot the next step for human rights. So what is the contemporary environment? I've talked already about the impact of 9-11 and the end of totalitarianism in Europe. But in many ways, it's deeper and in the longer term, more profound social and economic developments which make the case for a British Bill of Rights and Responsibilities in the United Kingdom, building upon the Human Rights Act and the Convention. Earlier this year, I gave that lecture in Oxford and in between uh, the Barbershop Quartet, uh, I spoke about democracy and identity, uh, in which I talked about how British society was changed beyond all recognition in my lifetime, and how the increasing heterogeneity of our population is, if anything, accelerating. This development is not unique to Britain, of course. Thanks to extraordinary advantage, advances in communications, dramatic cost reductions in transport, the, the explosion of international trade, individuals now cross borders and mix with people from different cultures and nationalities on a hitherto unknown scale. The impact of these changes on the United Kingdom is striking. Today, 4.3 million people, 8% of our population, double in a, in a decade, are from families who've come to these shores, mainly from South Asia, the Caribbean, and Africa, but increasingly from other parts of the world as, as well. It won't be too long before some cities and towns in England have 
of people from their, of their population from such backgrounds. One quarter of the population of Greater London today uh, was born abroad. One in five here in Cambridge. In many ways, this rapid process of uh, increasing heterogeneity has been and continues to be remarkably smooth. The vast majority of people who've settled in the United Kingdom from abroad have integrated well into mainstream society. They've made homes, got jobs, had families, and now playing a full role in society and have been generally well received. To borrow a phrase from Seymour uh, Martin Lipset, quotes, the melting pot is melting as never before. However, the data sh also shows a contradictory picture. Increasing integration for most people in most areas, but increasing segregation for some in others. And data published in the State of the English Cities report in May of 2006 highlighted this divergent. It shows segregation falling in quite a number of towns and cities, but increasing in eight. So increasing heterogeneity is not without its problems too. And there's been another major shift in society which is also relevant to this debate. The structure of British society, which has developed during a century and more of industrialization, has been rapidly transformed as a result of changes brought about by economic globalization. This profound period of socioeconomic change has helped to shift public attitudes. It's encouraged the rise of a much less deferential, more consumerist public. And in this more atomized society, people appear more inclined to think of themselves and of one another as customers rather than as citizens. The state has at times encouraged this perception in the way that it's referred to and treated the public, sometimes literally referring to those who make use of public services as customers or clients uh, rather than as citizens. In some respects, uh, these uh, are positive developments. People are more independent, more empowered. But in other respects, these developments pose problems too, especially when viewed in the context of liberal democracy. As Dr. Meg Russell of the, Uni of the uh, University of College London Constitutional Unit has said, it's difficult to find anything more antithetical to the culture of politics than the con contemporary culture of consumerism. Whilst politics is about balancing diverse needs to benefit the public interest, consumerism is about meeting the immediate desires of the individual. Whilst politics requires us to compr compromise and to collaborate as citizens, consumerism emphasizes unrestrained individual freedom of choice. Whilst politics recognizes that there are always resource constraints, modern consumerism increasingly encourages us to believe that we can have it all and now. Now, the problems of this at times solipsistic approach when applied to human rights is that it distorts the way in which people look at those rights. To an extent, rights have become commoditized, yet more items to be claimed. This is demonstrated in how some people seek to exercise their rights in a selfish way without regards to others, which injures the philosophical basis of inalienable fundamental human rights. But alongside that, some people resent the rights which are afforded to fellow humankind. Uh, we see this in the media uproar around human rights being a terrorist charter or there for the benefit of minorities alone. I'm gonna be working very closely with Lord Goldsmith, the former Attorney General, in, in his review of citizenship, to look at how a British Bill of Rights and Responsibilities can help better to combat this issue by helping to fo foster a stronger sense of citizenship. And I suggest that it can do so by establishing and articulating the balance between the rights to which we are all entitled and the obligations which we all owe to each other. This is not a new concept, goes back to Tom Paine and well beyond. Paine declared that a declaration of rights is by reciprocity a declaration of duties also. Whatever is my right as a man is also the right of another, and it becomes my duty to guarantee as well as to possess. So a Bill of Rights and Responsibilities imposes obligations on government, but also makes clear that the citizen has mutual obligations uh, to the other citizen. The extent of this horizontal relationship 
is something we'll explore. And we can look more recently than Tom Paine to, for example, the, that of South Africa as to how this could work in practice. There, Justice Cato Regan, judge of their constitutional court, describes the operation of this idea of horizontality. What is clear, she says, is that when a court develops the common law, for example, libel law, libel law, the court must consider the obligations imposed by the Bill of Rights. In the case of libel, this involves several rights, freedom of expression on the one hand and the right to dignity and privacy on the other. The court has to consider these rights in developing rules of common law liability, she says. And crucially, she goes on, our constitution does not carry a notion that one forfeits one's rights entirely if one does not observe one's obligations. And I suggest that we need to look at the lessons from South Africa, as from other jurisdictions, as to how they've applied a Bill of Rights in their own national context, and how this might apply in the United Kingdom as we seek to develop our Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. Once again, we see the balance of principle and practicality in operation. Few people would have prob a problem with the principle that we have a responsibility to each other and to the community as citizens. But the debate will centre around how far those responsibilities should be articulated and how they would operate. Now, over many years, there has been some debate about the idea of developing a list of rights and obligations which go with being a member of our society. And I suggest that such a bill could give people a clearer idea of what we can expect from states, from the state and from each other, and a framework for giving a practical effect to our common values. How if, however, if specifically British rights were to be added to those we already enjoy by virtue of the European Convention, we'd need to ensure that it would be of benefit to the country as a whole and not restrict the ability of the democratic elected government to decide upon the way in which resources were to be deployed in the national interest. For example, some have argued for the incorporation into our domestic law of economic and social rights, as they are, for example, uh, in uh, South Africa. But this would involve a significant, significant shift from Parliament to the judiciary in making the decisions that we currently hold to be the preserve of elected representatives, including decisions concerning public spending and taxation. And this is, as, as so much else, I agree entirely with the words of Lord Bingham in his recent and important lecture on the rule of law, when he said that the importance of predictability in law must preclude, and I quote, excessive innovation and adventurism by the judges. And he went on to say that he agreed with sentiments expressed by Judge Hayden of the High Court of Australia, who suggested that judicial activism taken to extremes could spell the death of the rule of law. Pro Vice Chancellor, in an enabling state, in a democratic society, it is far more than the law which binds us together. But the law has a powerful role to play. And the introduction of the Human Rights Act was a landmark in the development of our sense of rights and in binding our society. Notably, however, that act has not become, become an iconic statement of liberty as equivalent provisions have in the United States or has the South African Bill of Rights. Perhaps this is because our idea of rights, our statement of rights, has been the production of evolution, not of revolution. We've not had a struggle for self-determination or nationhood, nor have we been torn apart by social strife or had to f fight bitterly for equality, as in South Africa. Do we value in Britain these rights less as a result? Well, I don't think so. Uh, I do think an innate understanding of rights is part of our national psyche. It's the amniotic fluid in which we have grown. So too is an understanding of the obligations which we have to each other. But I think we need now to make them better understood. And if a Bill of Rights and Responsibilities which clarifies this relationship is to be more, however, than a legal document and becomes a charter of expressing our values as a society, it's vital that it is, as it were, owned by the British people and not just uh, by jurists. That's why we're initiating a full and wide-ranging debate with our Green Paper, one part of a substantial programme of constitutional renewal announced by the Prime Minister in July. And as the Prime Minister said in a speech uh, this morning, we will found the next stage of constitutional uh, development firmly on the story of British liberty. 
At the heart of British citizenship is the idea of a society based on laws which are made in a way which reflect the rights of citizens, regardless of ethnicity, gender, class, or religion. Alongside this sits the, uh, the right to participate in some way in the making of laws, the idea that all citizens are equal before the law and entitled to justice and the protection of law, the right to free expression of opinion, the right to live without fear of oppression or discrimination. As the governance of Britain Green Paper, which we published in July, stated, these guiding principles and ideals represent the starting point from which further debate may take place. Over the coming months, I'm going to publish a Green Paper on a Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, which will frame the debate about how we might codify these rights in a way, as I've suggested, which articulates more clearly the relationship between citizens, society, the community, and the state. And I look forward to many contributions on that, not least from the Faculty of Law here in Cambridge. Thank you very much indeed. very much, Mr. Straw, for that splendid lecture, uh, which was both illuminating and challenging. And, and I particularly like the way you finished by throwing out a direct challenge, as well as an invitation to all of us. Um, our speaker has, has kindly uh, agreed to uh, take questions. And, uh, and we have uh, uh, eight or nine minutes uh, for questions. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please feel free to do so. Mr. Stroll, would you not agree that the imposition of responsibilities might be said to be inherently bound up with the erosion of rights? And if so, how would you seek to avoid making the same mistake as you've accused your political colleagues or uh, as your political opponents are making in respect of the margin of appreciation and the application of the European Convention? Other question? Yes. Um, you spoke of uh, a Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, and you've explicitly added this phrase and responsibilities. Um, what's wrong with a responsibility and an obligation simply to obey the law? And what's wrong with the liberty to do whatever we please beyond that? <coughs> yes. Would you like to, to, to take those first? Then if there's time, we'll <laughs> enough to keep you going for a oh, few minutes. Okay. <laughs> Very good questions. Um, uh, gentleman here gets to the heart of uh, the issue here, which is um, if, if we owe each other responsibilities, does that erode uh, your human rights? Uh, no, and, and, but we have to secure a balance here. because and, and this comes back to my point about the fact we are citizens and not consumers. Rights cannot, it, it cannot just be a one-way street. Um, and let me say, the, sense of, the set of relationships is a, a complex one. I, I'm not suggesting uh, that in, our, in a free and democratic society, the citizen owes the state responsibility directly in return for rights uh, which the, the state ought to accord the citizen. We, we don't uh, live in a totalitarian state. Um, what I do suggest is that uh, citizens owe each other responsibilities and mutual obligations, first of all, and uh, that articulating that is really important to meet uh, the point of the uh, gentleman in the uh, uh, blue shirt over there, uh, which is, yes, of course, there is a fundamental responsibility, though I go beyond that, to obey the law, um, but developing that sense of, of responsibility, particularly when people are at the point of breaking the law, and therefore interfering with other rights, is something I think we, we have uh, to do. 
And I also, I also add, add this, that if we've got obligations to each other. We have obligations to the community as a whole, which is another point at which the, the consumer model completely breaks down. And through the community, uh, the community elects representatives who in turn, in, in a sense, come to per personify the state in a democratic society. So it's a complex set of relationships. And, and my concern in where we are today rather than where we were 10 years ago is to ensure that there is a better understanding of rights and obligations. It was implicit in everything that was done after the war, uh, and many of you presumably uh, uh, have, have studied or are studying jurisprudence with a great body of literature about the relationship between uh, rights and responsibilities, privileges and duties, uh, and so on. But I, I say it's to build up this a better and more comprehensive picture of how we live in a society and the role of the law that I want to achieve. Um, coming back to, to the gentleman over there, I, th I think I more or less answered it, but, it, but we, one has to go, I think, beyond just a simple responsibility to obey the law. We've also got to understand that even where people break the law, one of the marks of a democratic society is they have rights too. They don't lose their rights. Uh, they lose some rights when they break the law, for sure, including their, if, if they break the law sufficiently, uh, their immediate freedom uh, because uh, they can be incarcerated as a result. But they don't, for, it, for example, no matter how terrible the crime is, uh, crime is lose their rights to a fair trial. And, 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 and uh, to th these issues of due process are fundamental uh, to any society. But citizens, too, have, ought to have greater rights than those who are simply within the country, even though people within the country, however, whatever bad they've done and wherever they've come from, do have some fundamental rights, which we have to preserve at all costs. So it's a complicated situation. That's what, what I'm aiming to do is what the Prime Minister is aiming to do, is to get across both this complexity, the sort of texture of, the, uh, of, of uh, rights and responsibilities, in a way perhaps we haven't done so up to now. On the issue of the gentleman who asked at the back about human rights to Muslims, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not a Muslim, but I represent a very large number of, of members of the Muslim faith in my constituency. And I have to say that many people of the Muslim faith in my constituency say to me uh, what is true is that people are better able uh, both to celebrate their faith and uh, to act as citizens in uh, this country uh, than they are in many other countries around the world, including, they name, a number of countries which are dominated by people of the Muslim faith. Uh, now, your uh, perception from your head shaking is a different one. Uh, sir, and I'd like to know uh, more, uh, more about that, so, so do drop me a note. And I, no, I'm serious, and I, and I was, because I'm always fascinated when someone's own experience is completely counter uh, to, not, not mine, because I'm not a, not, not a member of the Muslim faith, but that of my constituents. Um, and what I say it is, is the case. Uh, and we have sought greatly to strengthen uh, the, the rights of people of other faiths uh, recently through the passage through Parliament of the legislation uh, making a criminal offence uh, to incite uh, hatred on uh, religious grounds. Um, the last point came from this gentleman uh, in blue. Why are you all wearing, well, some of you wearing blue? It's a, <laughs> uh, that, it's a law society, okay, that's fine. I mean, I know, I know. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, anyway. Um, we didn't, let me make this clear, and there, uh, re read the Intelligence and, and Security uh, uh, Committee uh, report. There, there is not a shred of evidence that we ever allowed the United States our facilities or were complicit with them in any way in terms of extraordinary re 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 rendition through to the United Kingdom through United Kingdom airspace. I was Foreign Secretary the whole time that, that this uh, question was a live issue. I've given my undertakings about that. I know what happened, and I know what did not happen. And there's not a shred of evidence, and there isn't any evidence, because the allegations that we somehow participated in extraordinary rendition or, or other unlawful acts is untrue. It, it is now half past six, um, uh, and so I think the time has come. Fine, well, there's an invitation. Yes.
Can, can you speak up? Can, can you speak up a bit? Sorry, we can't. Last one up there. Yep. Matt. My name is Matt Wright. Thank you very much for your presentation. I thank you for that last approach. I have a unusual experience. Um, a year of science on the Mars Act. I've done two exerted and minimal acts of voluntary human rights. We have a song called Act of Parliament. I thank Parliament for letting me do so. And every time someone in the National or in other ways complaining about their rights, they dig some things up and drop them out, <coughs> and anyone else can learn. To what extent do you really believe that talking about responsibility is dangerous, or will we really end up as this was the point I wanted to make in 2006, a rehashing of what already exists, changing nothing, and merely being reinvented again in a new way at the end of the day? Thank you. Um, <laughs> to the, the, uh, the question at the, the, the back, uh, <coughs> quoting uh, Shami's Chakrabarti, I mean, I, I didn't hear uh, Shami's speech. Uh, uh, Shami Chakrabarti worked for me when in the Home Office, and she was a very good uh, lawyer, and I'd, I used to have many happy hours uh, having discussions with her about uh, aspects of uh, uh, new laws we're developing. I've got a high respect for her. I just think that she was hyperbolic uh, when she... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, spoke that way. Um, uh, I, uh, I mean, she, she had a, 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 it was a very difficult period uh, f uh, for us. I don't say we got everything right, but we did our best following uh, the 11th of September and then the 7th of July, extremely difficult uh, period. Um, but I don't uh, recognize uh, the, uh, her, her description uh, of uh, her use of adjectives, nor I, I don't believe a democratic government should be called a regime. However, uh, I will uh, t uh, take this up with her and hope that, uh, and, s uh, <laughs> uh, and, and send, her, s send her a copy of the lecture. Um, the, um, uh, at the back over here, you ask, uh, it's quite an important, I mean, a very important question. And, the, and, and it also arises in respect of uh, what we've done uh, concerning the, uh, the, the, the Charter of Rights in the, in the uh, draft treaty. I mean, our, our concern is, and I'm, I, we took, yes, we are, we're, we're seeking to close those, I mean, not to close those rights. I think we, we whatever else one says about uh, the last 10 years, including Shami Trakabati, I think most people would accept we've, we've actually done pretty well when it comes to the development of economic uh, and social rights in law and in practice. It's really a debate, as I indicated uh, towards the end of my speech, about whether you, you access the, those rights and develop uh, those rights by political action, or whether you, you, you establish some general principles, which would have to be pretty general, and then argue those principles through the courts, and, and obviously then have, have the courts uh, being able to, to command resources, because it's an inevitable part of the development of social and economic rights, um, and making other decisions. Now, other, some other common law jurisdictions um, operate in a different way. Uh, it, it, the Indian uh, Supreme Court uh, famously, um, f has filled a vacuum, um, uh, uh, which, or, or famously filled a vacuum, certainly in terms of decision making uh, in respect of pollution in New Delhi, uh, and decided after years and years of, of debate and argument as to how they could stop being poisoned uh, by the emissions from two stroke uh, engines, just to ban them uh, and to uh, insist that. Uh, uh, gas uh, was used, pressurized gas was used instead. Now, that appears to have been acceptable within the Indian context, and it's a common law country, and one we should, sh whose example uh, we, sh we should uh, take great interest in. I don't happen to think, however, uh, that it would be acceptable here, and I think what, what people here uh, better ex uh, expect is that those kind of decisions are made by uh, democratic bodies, whether they're Parliament or Mayor for London, Scottish Parliament, Welsh Assembly, or a local authority, whatever level. So that's the, the debate, but, I'm not, but we're not immune to, let me say, because I've set, set out 
where we're coming from. We're not immune to argument on this, and it may be you end up with, an, uh, that you with, with some declaration of rights which provides a framework which is not justiciable, but, but to be continued. On, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, Mr. Dyson, I don't entirely uh, understand uh, uh, the, the, the point that you were making. Um, because, um, I mean, I, th I think uh, that you are suggesting that the Compensation Act 2006 uh, was simply restating the existing law. And therefore, I suppose what you were saying uh, was that would uh, any development of a British Bill of Rights and Responsibilities uh, be a state of the already uh, existing obvious? Is that a fair way of putting it? Okay, okay. Well, I mean, yeah, look, I mean, I mean, of course, when you go to court, you're claiming your rights. Uh, it's, it's very odd to go to court to <laughs> seek a declaration uh, that you've been responsible uh, for something. <laughs> Although it's a, it's a nice idea and it make good, uh, develop uh, work, f even more work for lawyers, which I'm in favour of. Um, but the, the, but it's not, I mean, of course, and you know, the way we, our system works, everybody's fam very familiar with, with one side claims their rights, the other side claims their rights, and the job of the court is to balance these. But it's, it's to, to pick up the point that, that was being made by uh, the, the senior judge in South Africa that, that I quoted, I mean, what, what the courts are there for, and wh which they're already doing, what we hope to see developed, not just restated, is being able, within the context of the European Convention, better to, to, to balance people's rights and responsibilities, and, and alongside that, to answer the gentleman over there as well as the gentleman here, uh, to build up this sense amongst our citizens about how rights are not just a free good, uh, that they are balanced by responsibilities and mutual obligations. Thank you very much. my job to say a few very brief words of thanks. And before I thank our speaker, I would just briefly like to say a word of general thanks to those within the law faculty who've helped organize this evening. It's a great event to have a senior minister with us, and we have to make great preparations accordingly. And I would just like to thank our chairman. I'd like to thank my colleagues in cells Catherine Barnard and Oki Odudu. And I'd like particularly to thank the support staff, Catherine Bedford in cells, who's worked very hard, and Kirsty Allen and David Wills, and not least John Seymour, our custodian. But mainly, I'd like to briefly thank our speaker. Um, I think that was an excellent and memorable speech. I'm delighted that we were reminded about the British origins of key parts of the European Convention and that it dates back ultimately to Magna Carta. I had a very moving meeting with Lord Denning when I interviewed him when he was 92 and a half. He said, somebody said to me afterwards, when you're that age, you mention the halves, don't you? <laughs> and, and uh, at the end, he said, John, having acquired the politician's knack of calling everybody by their first names, what do you teach your students in Cambridge? And I said, I'm a, a bit of contract, a bit of criminal law. Do you teach them about Magna Carta? He said. And I said, I, I don't know. Oh, you should teach them about Magna Carta, he said. <laughs> he said, here's my copy, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Let's read some bits of it together. <laughs> and we did, and I have always taught my students about it ever since, and I'm delighted that the minister reminded us of that origin of our human rights culture tonight. Secondly, he reminded us quite rightly of the dark age that we went through in Europe that led up to the creation of the European Convention on Human Rights. 
um, happily I was born after the war. There are some of us here who were old enough to remember it, <coughs> just one. Um, and they will be able to know much better than I do the, um, the point that was made there. But I went to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem once, and I think one of the most frightening things I saw was a photograph of somebody with a shaved head being led through the streets in Germany with a label around his neck saying, Ich werde nicht mehr der Polizei besperren. I'm not going to complain to the police again. That's what it's like to live in a country without human rights and without the rule of law. And thirdly, we carry away tonight what I think is a most valuable notion of the need to remember the balance of obligations among us in society and the dangers that we have if human rights become commodi commoditized a neologism which I shall treasure for future use because I think it's worth it. Um, Lord Chancellor, your predecessor but one, Derry Irvin, um, great man, great friend of this faculty, I think um, initially, together with you, was responsible for us having the Human Rights Act. Your immediate predecessor, Lord Faulkner, defended it with this excellent document in 2006 when he was asked by the Prime Minister to look into the Human Rights Act and essentially to see whether it needs to be repealed, and he pointed out all the media distortions and misrepresentations of it and said, we don't need to repeal it. Um, you tonight have put the boot most satisfyingly in on those who think we ought to get rid of the Human Rights Act, and uh, you stand as a reaffirmer of it, and it sounds as if we are ahead for a further development from you to do with some kind of Bill of Rights. You uh, challenged the law faculty to engage with you in discussion. Count on us. Uh, we'll be with you. We will help you debate. Thank you so much for your most stimulating speech tonight. Thank you.